So welcome to the STEM speaker series, which is offered every October, November, February, March, and April of each academic year at 11 10 and repeated at 5 o'clock and also recorded and uploaded to the STEM speaker series website. So if you were to visit the DCCC STEM speaker series website, there are 20 talks already archived up there, very interesting ones in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So you might want to visit that website and enjoy other talks from the past five years. To give you a preview of coming attractions, I have all the talks arranged for 2016, 2017. And those five talks include the woman who really discovered DNA, not Watson, not Crick, but a woman discovered DNA and didn't get credit for it. The chemistry of art restoration, Here's an interesting one, CSI, Crime Scene Investigation Media. The media police department's going to come and talk about how they use biology, chemistry, physics, and computer analysis to catch criminals in Delaware County. There'll also be a talk on the science and art and medicinal benefits of chocolate. And the final talk will be on President James Abram Garfield as mathematician. We had a president who was actually a mathematician and got assassinated just months into his term as president in the 1880s. So that will also be an interesting talk. Our speaker today is Russ Johnson, an environmentalist who has run nature centers for 10 years who is an environmental activist and has a number of publications regarding ecology. And he's going to talk about what we can do at the individual level to protect our planet for our own lives and for future generations. So without further introduction, please welcome Russ Jones. Thank you. I'm going to pass this roster around if you haven't signed it already, please put your name and the professor for whom you're getting extra credit, if you're getting extra credit. Please circulate it on this side of the auditorium, then the other side, and eventually should make it back to me. And Dr. Kolpas forgot to mention, please set your phasers to stun. Okay, it'll be a friendly presentation. I hope it'll be a little interactive for you. Uh, I have been involved in the environment since I was in high school because the first Earth Day happened when I was in high school and I just went to my 40th high school reunion. So it's been a long time and there's been a lot of change in things, especially in technology over the years that has really influenced how we view the world and one thing that just really impacted everybody um, Many, many years ago today, a piece, just a footnote in your history, but I stayed up all night to watch this, you know, the moon landing, the Apollo missions. This photograph showed a tiny little blue marble out in space. And when you zoom in, you see it's the Earth. So the message to everybody watching at that time was the Earth is a tiny little fragile spaceship in a vast cosmos. So we gotta take care of what we have. And that was just one thing that influenced and spurred us to a new environmental movement, which has happened you know, since the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And today we're even entering a new phase of a new environmental movement. So I'm gonna to talk to you about environmentalism today, which is gonna be much more hands-on than it ever was. So, uh, Dr. Kolpis didn't mention, but I also spent 10 years in environmental policy work. That took me to Washington, D.C. to propose legislation to make the Delaware uh, River a wild and scenic river, one of the sections of that, uh, to the state of Harrisburg to get a bill passed that a percentage of the state's vehicle fleet, of all the vehicles the state owns, 10% of them have to be hybrids. So I've done a lot of environmental activism 
uh, you know, in, in the policy arena as well, particularly in rivers. So when I was working on the Delaware River, I wanted to know what was the earliest environmental law ever passed. So I did a little research and I came up with this. If someone could just please read that to me. Oh, okay. That's the Code of Hammurabi from 1772 BC or thereabouts, depending on which version of radiocarbon dating you use. And in the river part that came up said, if a man opens his canal for irrigation and neglects it and it floods somebody else, you are responsible for your environmental consequences. At least that's how I read it. To them it was more about land use and regulating the economy and making sure that no one's fields got wiped out because food security was an important issue. If someone's fields got wiped out in a flood, you'd have a famine. Okay, and I found this interesting passage about trees. I just threw that up there too. Actually, 300 years before Hammurabi, there was in the kingdom of Ur, Ur Namu, we have a fragment of code from his cuneiform that cites very similar kinds of policy that you're irrigating via canals along the Tigris and Euphrates River, you're responsible for managing that resource. So it's about resource management. The very first environmental law was about resource management. Go back to ecology, resource management, economy, rule of the house. But it has the same roots in Greek language as ecology, which is study of the house. I devoted so much of my career to environmental education because I think you've got to study the house before you can wisely rule it. And I think you need to have good science and good research so you can make those wise decisions. And then you can have really good policies and enforcement to make sure those decisions stick and don't just get bowled over in the course of everyday activity. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Because we had a little thing called the Spanish Armada. Okay, what's the connection between the Spanish Armada and ecology? Okay, so uh, Queen uh, Elizabeth took over in England. She was a Protestant after Henry VIII changed uh, the religion of England so that, uh, uh, so that he could remarry but according to the rest of the Catholic community in all of Europe, she was an illegitimate child because she was the daughter, okay, that's all history. King Philip of Spain sent an armada to try to take back England. He was gonna meet up with a huge army he had in Holland because he had just put down a Catholic reformation, uh, a reformation against the Catholics there. And he sent them into the uh, English Channel, his his fleet was disturbed and scattered, and later he lost 140 out of the, of the ships. He lost about a quarter of all, or a third of all his ships. Well, to have ships, this is the ecological connection. He needed steel, and he needed wood. There's a problem of ecological management there. For steel, this is before oil was discovered and used as a fuel. This is before anthracite coal was discovered and used as a fuel. So what did they use to melt iron ore to extract the steel? They had to burn trees. They clear cut a forest, stack it up, cover it with mud and clay to keep out the oxygen and then ignite it and get a slow burn. That drove off all the volatiles and the moisture and left you with charcoal and charcoal would burn hot enough to smelt steel. After his armada was destroyed, the king knew that England was gonna give a counterpunch, which they did. The English armada was a failure too, but England did make a counterpunch. Well, he knew he needed a lot more steel, so he sent his foresters out. Uh, he sent his charcoal burners out to burn, to cut down the forest and burn charcoal. But he realized he needed wood for the ships too. So he sent out foresters the world's first ever environmental professionals to protect habitat, to protect resources, he sent them out to try to protect the forest so he'd have parts of wood for his ships. That's a conflict. 
The charcoal burners were pretty well organized. The foresters were off on their own wandering around. The charcoal burners killed all the foresters, cut all the forests, and Spain never really recovered its dominance of the seas after that. It was really this environmental conflict that had a huge impact on the destiny of that empire. So does ecology man matter today too? Do our ecological management choices matter today too? Yeah, same way. The process of cutting that charcoal completely changed the ecology of Spain. And this is what it looks like today. Caesar complained when he had the Gallic Wars, and you read the Gallic commentaries, Julius Caesar complained. It was so hard to move his army through the impenetrable forests of Spain. Today, very little forest in Spain. And that changed because of the Spanish Armada and management decisions made after that. So we skip ahead uh, a couple thousand years to the Industrial Revolution. Okay, this was another huge change and it began the first wave of kind of global trade relations other than empire building in the uh, uh, 16th century, we move ahead to the 17th and 18th century of the Industrial Revolution. That changed the whole outlook on environment and environmental, environmental management too. It wasn't what we have today as the environmental movement. This was really centered around the industrial factories and people moving off the land where they had subsistence level farming and moving to the cities and getting jobs and then suffering the consequences of personal health. Because what you had when all these factories are burning peat and coal is you had an immense amounts of smog. And in the 1700s, about every 10 years, and in the 1800s, early 1800s, they were just killing smogs. If anyone had a weak immune system, infants, children, the aged, anybody who had spent time in a coal mine had a little touch of emphysema, they were dying in the hundreds and in the thousands every time there was a smog in the industrial cities of England. Uh, England has a particular weather pattern where you can get a temperature inversion and the uh, warm temperature at the ground level is capped in by another uh, weather front coming over the top of it and circulation doesn't happen so all the smog just stays right there and builds up and builds up and builds up. And that still goes on today, but I'll show you a picture of that in a minute. But during that time period, people began to react against industrialization. You had uh, the uh, movement where the workers would throw their wooden shoes into the cogs of the machinery, their sabot, into the machinery to try to clog it up so the factory would go out of business so they could go back to their jobs in the countryside. And we have saboteurs as a result uh, of, of that kind of action. William Wordsworth wrote these words in a poem, The World is Too Much With Us, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers, little we see in nature that is ours. That was a very, very influential poem, and one of my favorites today. But it started a whole movement to romanticize nature. This is a picture of the Oxbow in Massachusetts on the Connecticut River, and right behind here is an ancient, even older oxbow. I guess you can probably see a little bit of it there. Uh, that has now become a nature center. That's where the first nature center is uh, that I started uh, back in the uh, early 90s. Started up a nature center there on some Audubon property that was preserved for the wildlife. So that's one of my favorite pictures that shows, uh, shows the ancient oxbow. But it's a whole movement in art, in literature, and people starting to take vacations back in the countryside to get away from the smog. People building houses on the main line to get away from the smog in the city. And that's the start of suburban sprawl, which is a big issue today. Uh, but it all came about kind of, kind of romanticized nature. Nature's beautiful and bucolic. And in the cities, it's the machine, it's machinery, it's smog, it's pollution, it's noise, it's trucks and 
wagons moving every which way all the time. You can't get away from that day or night. So it really became and set a culture that the environmental movement was man against machine. Man needed nature, man needed these products. We all drive cars, we all wear shoes. We don't want to give those up. We don't want to go back to having to use the pitchfork every morning and, and wake up at 6 a.m. and milk the cows, but we do have to worry about the emissions from these uh, in industries. That's Bethlehem Steel up in Bethlehem in its, in its heyday. Fast forward a little bit here, uh, move over a little bit, make it local to uh, Pennsylvania. After the Romantic Movement, another movement started, but it had its roots back in the uh, 1680s. William Penn uh, got his land grant from the king, 1680, came over in about 1683, had the William Penn Treaty uh, pictured here. And when he came to Pennsylvania, he wrote in his early journals that a squirrel could travel from Philadelphia to Harrisburg through the woods without ever getting out of the trees. One continuous forest. So they named it Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania. And it probably looked a little bit like this today. Just a vast continuous forest. Then, <coughs> in the 1800s, <coughs> the Industrial Revolution, but a lot of clear cutting of the forest, not just for timber, but a lot of it <coughs> was for tan bark. Because at that time, the railroads opened up the west, hunters were slaughtering the buffalo herds, the buffalo pelts were being sent back east because they were great. You tan it, you got a nice thick blanket. But to tan a buffalo hide, you need acids, you need tannic acid, and one way to get that is to take the bark off of trees, soak that in big bats, and that creates tannic acid. So they would go up country into Pennsylvania, they would clear cut the forest, and they would float it all downstream in the rivers, and they'd float it to uh, chemical plants and factories where they made the tannic acid, and then they would tan the hides, and then they ship them all over the world. So that clear cutting led to something called the desert of Pennsylvania. Do you know Pennsylvania was a desert at one time? It was the desert of Pennsylvania. Gifford Pinchot from Pennsylvania, from up in the Milford area on the Delaware River, he saw this all happening and he noticed it. And he traveled extensively out west and saw the deserts out there and he said, I don't want Pennsylvania to become a sandy, barren wasteland forever like it seems to be out west. I would like to preserve that. So he actually started the U.S. Forest Service. He started a whole movement we call the conservation movement. That he cares so much about the bears and the raccoons and clean drinking water. No. He really cared about the trees and he really wanted to preserve them to have a second crop for the future because he saw once you clear cut an area, all the loggers up there lost their jobs. The factory that was taking the tan bark from that watershed went out of business and was abandoned. Like you can go to the village of Lehigh Tannery today and find abandoned vats. Went out of business because they used the resource as if it was inexhaustible, but it did get exhausted. It got wiped out. Once it was clear cut, you had to move on. No one was giving a thought to conserving that resource for the future and certainly not for replanting it. So, Gifford Pinchot started the U.S. Forest Service together with some influential politicians including Teddy Roosevelt and they had the idea that yes we can replant these areas so we'll have another crop of timber, we can control the cutting so that it's not all cut at once and left completely naked. And they had a problem with canals built for navigation getting sedimented in with sediment because the runoff from the naked hills was so great. So it was impacting the Delaware and Lehigh Canal, the Delaware and Raritan Canal, all these canals were suffering and, and suffering from the sediment as well. So the conservation movement doesn't say you know, we're going to preserve all of ecology. It says 
We're going to preserve natural resources for the future use of mankind, just to use them. Okay? The highest, but he did set forth this idea of the highest and best use for the greatest good. Now today we can extrapolate and say, well, the highest and best use for the greater good might be to leave that forest intact so it contributes to a total functioning ecosystem because we're getting oxygen from those trees too, not just timber. He was concerned with timber, but we are extrapolating what he said and being concerned about the oxygen and the fact that those trees can reduce carbon in the air by absorbing some of that in their growth. Okay, so we're looking at that holistically now, but that was a conservation movement. Teddy Roosevelt was one of his friends, helped get the U.S. Forest Service going, helped get the National Park System going, 100th anniversary of the National Parks this year. Teddy Roosevelt went on expeditions out west, met a man named John Muir, an influential thinker in the environmental movement. And it became a preservation movement, not just conservation for the sake of being able to log another generation of trees 80 years from now, but that some parts of nature were indeed so special that we ought to preserve them. Because John Muir took him to the old growth Sequoia Forest <coughs> and to Yosemite and to the, the Grand Canyon, places like that, on a series of camping and hunting and fishing trips. So this is a synthesis of that early romanticized nature for the sake of nature. We need to get out of nature and have vacations from the industry. And the conservation movement, we've got to save something for future use. And this is a synthesis into the preservation movement that some things just deserve to be preserved. Because the scenery out there is so awesome in the West. I hope anyone travel out West? Anyone been to Yosemite? Just an amazing, awesome place. And that could definitely inspire an environmental movement, right? So that was really awesome. Oh, if you're joining late, please do sign the roster. We'll, we'll send that back to you. Yeah. Uh, okay. So Muir's theory was salvation of the human soul is in nature. We are an integral part of the natural system, and we have to save large chunks of nature, totally intact, not just for human use, but because the bears have a right to live, and the fish have a right to live, and even the funguses have a right to live. So they have their own inalienable rights to live as well. Not just for immediate human economic use. Preservation movement. And one of John Muir's quotes <coughs> is really attributed with starting the whole modern ecology movement, that is this quote. Whenever we try to pick anything out from the universe, we find it connected to everything else. That pretty much is a watchword for today's modern ecology movement. Everything is connected to everything else. So today's environmental movement really, you know, is kind of well, the 70s, 80s, 50s, 60s. It was kind of pretty much, you still had industry going on, you still had factories getting bigger, you had more and more products, we had plastic invented, we had automobiles, uh, we had a couple of wars, we had all kinds of things going on driving technology. So those technologies had consequences. Radiation from fallout, from testing, the potential radiation leak from nuclear power plants, 30th anniversary of Chernobyl, today. Three Mile Island. At Three Mile Island. Uh, and, and a few other, Fukushima, just a couple years ago. So we have this. So for a while, when I was growing up, environmentalism was kind of in the 70s and 80s, was kind of pick an issue, any issue. So I don't know, what's your issue? Uh, you know, is it, is it smog? Is it radiation? Is it uh, people complaining about, you know, the electromagnetic radiation going through high tension power lines that are gonna affect your brain? There's all kinds of issues, and everybody picks one and they get going on it. But take it all together, we have to remember that you can't pick any one thing out because everything is connected. You know, the nuclear power plant is making the energy which is going through those transition lines and it's in competition with the coal-fired power plant which is creating that smog and it's in competition with the, 
the oil mining and the fracking and the uh, mountaintop mining that is producing the acid mine drainage that's hitting the rivers. So it's all connected. So yeah, pick one issue and work on it. But keep the whole big picture in mind. Keep John Muir in mind. Everything is connected to everything else. Just gotta keep that in mind as the fundamental tenet to modern environmental environmentalism. So, smog, I mentioned in London, in England, in the Industrial Revolution, killed people. The great smog of London of 1952. This is daylight. This is noon in Trafalgar Square. 4,000 people died in a matter of a couple of days from smog. Well, just a couple of years ago, Beijing. It is, we have an Olympic here, Summer Olympics coming up this year in, in Brazil this summer. The last Olympics in summer was in Beijing, and they had a huge problem with smog. They're afraid the games would not happen because the athletes would asphyxiate themselves trying to run and breathe and do the marathon in this kind of a smog. Well, the Chinese being a command and control structure, they just said, shut down every factory for a couple of weeks, no cars, you see people walking here, cars aren't moving, there's no headlights on, those cars are parked. If you move your car, you're going to jail. Uh, if you run your factory, you're the boss, you know, that's it for you. Uh, and, and they managed to cure the smog by shutting down for a couple of weeks in time for the Olympics, so the Beijing Olympics could go forward. But again, that's, that's the environment affecting us in many, many ways. So everything we do in the environment affects us economically. What would have happened? if that smog had continued and they couldn't run the Olympics. They invested billions of dollars. They're expecting to make billions on tourism if nobody showed up. Big economic loss. So, what would you rather have? You know, your factories producing your goods. Uh, I spent a lot of time on river issues and there's a famous case out in the American West where they dammed the river to make a power plant to power an aluminum refining operation that aluminum refining industry made a couple million dollars a year. But it wiped out a salmon industry because the dam prevented salmon from spawning, worth way more money than, than the aluminum plant would produce. So you have to always balance ecognomy and ecology. The rule of the house versus the ecology. So even today, smog, still an issue. We had the Clean Air Act in this country to help reduce that a little bit, but we still have ozone alerts in the city of Philadelphia like five times a year. You drive on the blue route, you see the sign, take alternate transportation today because there's a, 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 a air index quality hazardous alert. Water is a big issue. Industrialization impacted that. When I was a kid and I was in high school, the Cuyahoga River burned. Not one oil spill or oil slick on the river. The river burned. Usually you use water to put out a fire. This is a river burning. That had a kind of a, a wake up call to a lot of us about the environment. And so it was not any one single point of pollution. It was the accumulated stuff all floating down here. And the fire melted and caused damage to a couple of bridges. And they're spraying, you can't quite see it on this picture, maybe you can a little bit on other photos from the time I remember seeing firemen on the British Bridge spraying water down onto the fire, which is on the water. Okay, so that was a bit of a wake up call. If a river can burn, and it wasn't the only river that burned. On the Delaware River at that time, there was a dead, deoxygenated zone. No oxygen in the river for 13 or 14 miles. So all the migratory fish that wanted to come up past Philadelphia and go upstream to the little tributaries, they could not get upstream and breathe. They couldn't swim through it. They'd sense the lack of oxygen, turn around, swim away, or die. And I remember reading reports at the time that pilots flying into the Philadelphia airport at 2,000, 3,400 feet coming down could smell the river. That's how they knew they were getting close to Philadelphia, because it was so polluted. 
Philadelphia was once a huge industrial area. Uh, today, it's, it's kind of moved. And our pollution that we used to have in Philadelphia is now in China. But they're having the same pollution issues that we have. But when a river burns, that's a bad thing. And that was a wake-up call to a lot of people going into the 70s. We had massive, massive fish kills. Uh, and I can't remember where I got this slide. This was a, a red tide in, I think, Corpus Christi, Texas, caused by industrial uh, effluent run, trying to run out into the ocean, but tides and waves coming in and trapping that pollution. And it just caused uh, a massive, massive fish kill in the estuaries and the uh, bayous down there. Wildlife was a, a big impact. And, and this way we got kind of the romantic, natural people who just loved wildlife and nature to get involved with the environmental movement because they realized they had to do something about the environment to protect wildlife. We almost lost the bald eagle, the symbol of our country, because the eagles were laying their eggs, then the, they would go to sit on the eggs to warm them, and the shells would break. DDT. DDT. It was pesticides. But this was not just happening among the eagles, and Rachel Carson was a naturalist who wrote this book, very influential book, Silent Spring, about how we would have a silent spring with no bird calls at all if we didn't do something about the pesticide problem because the pesticide chemicals were accumulating up the food chain. You spray it on the plants, the grasshoppers eat it, the shrews eat the grasshoppers, something comes and eats the shrew, and then the eagle comes and eats that, and all that pesticide that was spread over all these acres condenses up to one bird. Uh, then that bird's gonna have uh, issues trying to stay alive, trying to make it through the winter. The same thing right now with mercury and other heavy metals in the dolphins. It gets into the ocean, it builds up into the dolphins. That's fine, they live until they have babies. Then the females are trying to metabolize fat to make milk because they're mammals to feed the, the babies. And then they die because they start to metabolize the fat where that all that mercury is stored and they get a huge shock load in their system which destroys their, their neural system and then the females die. Oh, which by the way kills the infants too. Okay. Oh, then lead in Flint, Michigan. Lead in Flint, Michigan, current topic. Okay, so that accumulates up the food chain. This is where we began, began to understand that what we spray out on the land in terms of pesticides, yeah, that's great. We get more food, food is cheaper, that farmer makes a profit, he can buy sneakers, keeps the sneaker factory going, but it comes back to haunt us if we don't keep in mind that everything is connected because the rain washes this into the creek and then it impacts the fish and the eagles eat the fish. So that's where the, the pesticide problem was first noticed was in the, the raptors, especially the eagles. But whatever we do to the earth does come back. Mountaintop mining. Take the top off a mountain to get at the layer of coal that's in there. Used to be you just mine your way in and you leave the top of the mountain. Now it's cheaper with the earth moving equipment we've got today. Just take the top of the mountain, throw it into the valley. Oops, there used to be a river in that valley. What's happening? All this newly, this is chemistry. Any chemistry majors in the room? No one studied chemistry? Okay, when you have this much new rock exposed that has not been exposed to the atmosphere for millions of years, it interacts with the oxygen and the carbon dioxide in the air to form carbolic acid and other acids, and that gets into the groundwater, and then we have acid mine drainage. And the acidity can be two acids, say, or frog eggs. Frogs lay their eggs, they're dehydrated, they swell up and absorb that water, the acid gets in, dead egg, okay? So, same thing with fish eggs. So, acid mine drainage can wipe out an entire river system, especially if you take a mountaintop and throw it into the river valley that used to be there. And that's so we can have cheap coal. And it's ugly. Not to mention that it's a pretty ugly pit. Uh, 
I forget where this picture is taken. I'll have to look that up in my notes at some point. But whatever we have, and if I were doing this presentation for high school kids, I would say, name something you have with you today. And they would say, oh, my sweatshirt. Oh, it's made of cotton. That was grown on a farm. Herbicides, pesticides were used. Your sweatshirt you chose to wear today had an environmental impact. Oh, shoes, they're made from oil. That was extracted from the ground. Oh, a cell phone, it's got heavy metals that were mined and refined and smelted. It took coal and oil and gas to melt those rocks to get that cell phone for you. Anyone here not have a cell phone? Any, anybody not have a cell phone? Everyone here has a cell phone? Okay. You have a little piece of this. Okay? So, just think about the choices we all make every day. It has an impact. I'm not saying don't have a cell phone because guess what? I have one too. So, are you gonna, how are you going to make these choices about how much impact to have to get what you want? And that's kind of what the modern environmental movement is about is now, what about your personal choices? This happened when I was in school. Uh, there was a canal in a Niagara Fall, near Niagara Falls, New York. The canal was lined with clay to keep the water in it. So a company that made chemicals and did processing of machinery and things dumped barrels and barrels and barrels and barrels. Uh, something like you know 200,000 tons of hazardous waste into this canal all in the drums, and then they capped it over with clay. And then they sold it for a dollar to a school district to build two schools, one of them pictured here. And the school district then, to pay for the building of the school, sold off a lot of the land to a housing development when tract housing was going. Uh, and a few years later, they went to dig a new sewer line or something, and they broke through the clay cap. And all those chemicals leached into the water supply for all these houses. And it made everybody sick. And it was a battle for years. And this had been going on since the 50s when they were depositing that stuff. And then the school district got it and developed it. It wasn't until 78 until it started getting a lot of media attention. And uh, I was uh, in college at the time. And we had this huge thing about Love Canal. I was in college to be pre-med. I thought, okay, everyone told me all my life, oh, Russ, you're so intelligent, be a doctor. You'll make a lot of money. And Love Canal, I saw this. And I saw how many people were sick. And we had photos of the deformed you know, babies and the, the kids with the rashes and, and all these things. And I said, does it make sense to be a doctor and cure a few people who are sick, when I could work for the environment and prevent something like this from ever happening and save thousands of people from even getting sick in the first place. So this was a big moment for me. And I changed my major right then and there. You know, so I'm not a doctor today. I just devoted my life to the environment. We had oil spills. I worked on one of these. I went out in college and I went to the Great Bay off of New Hampshire. Uh, in my undergraduate and I went out and we had these white zoot suits we called them and we spread the hay and we collected up the oil and it's a messy nasty job we have all of these uh, there was a oil spill in California that caught the attention of a, a senator named Gaylord Nelson and he this was in the 60s we had the anti-war anti-Vietnam war movement we had the civil rights movement <laughs> Gaylord Nelson had this realization that if we could take a youth movement, a student movement, an activist movement, and put together all these separate issues into one big movement, then we might be able to get some legislation passed. We might be able to get some of the attention of some of the big corporations to do things in a better way. So it was after this huge oil spill out on the West Coast that, and I don't know if I have a picture of it, uh, but that Gaylord Nelson decided he would sponsor something called Earth Day, which is, you know, has been going since then. And it was massive, 
Uh, I led cleanups on the roadsides. We had three weekends where we cleaned up the roadsides. We thought that was a good thing to do. Millions of people went to the nation's capital, rallies all over, every college had sit-ins. What's the biggest like gathering or demonstration people you ever had here at, at college that you guys have ever participated in? How many people? 100, 1,000? Nobody's been to any of these ac ac actions. Uh, there was just a cancer march. There was, you know, uh, there's a, well, think about, uh, you know, the 1% versus the 99% to Occupy Wall Street. It was that kind of a thing for us. And, and still is, because people still gather for Earth Day festivals and events. So there were a massive outpouring on this. For the first Earth Day, we got the idea that, yeah, our generation could and should, and people always, Earth Day every day, should get together, exchange information, exchange ideas. There were a lot of teach-ins because it was very much college-based. And uh, we, we started all that and, and did all that and participated in all that. So Earth Day came about and it set a kind of a new environmental movement where we had protesting. Uh, Seabrook nuclear plant, uh, a 0.6 on the Richter scale earthquake on the day that the power company of New Hampshire said that Seabrook would be a perfectly safe place to build a nuclear power plant. So I was part of a group called Clamshell Alliance, a little group within there from my college. And uh, people marched to Seabrook, thousands and thousands of people. Uh, famous musicians like Pete Seeger, if any of you know him, uh, were there. Uh, if you're into women's music, Holly Near was there. Uh, I led a bike trip. I led all my people by bike. Uh, thousands of people were arrested. I was not arrested there, I was arrested later. Okay, uh, we had a massive thunderstorm coming up because I was the most active biker in the group. I rode into town to buy uh, boxes and boxes of trash bags so people could make ponchos because of the sudden massive rainstorm. While I was away, everybody I came with was arrested. So I missed out on being arrested. But they took them to the local. They took them to the local national armory. Now you had a big chain link fence around there, and you had two bathrooms for thousands of people. So people were desperate for toilet paper. So I rode. I rode my bike to the grocery store, and I bought, you know, boxes and boxes of toilet paper. And I rode my bike back to the armory, and I started throwing rolls of toilet paper over the fence. That's when I got arrested. Vandalizing public property, throwing toilet paper over a fence. Okay. So anyway, I got off, uh, but uh, <clears throat> most of the people that protested with me got off. They, you know. But we were willing to go to jail and be arrested to make this statement. <clears throat> and that was what was needed then, the protest movement. And today we still have those kinds of protest movements. There are people who chain themselves to trees. There are people in... Uh, in Flint, Michigan, who sat on the steps of the city hall until they got action. So that can still happen today. You can still participate in these things. There was a, and still going on today, a big obstructionism movement. Uh, this is Greenpeace. You might hear about Sea Shepherd. They intervened trying to get between the Japanese whaling ships and the whales. And it's kind of like a little war out on the seas and kind of like an act of piracy. Greenpeace got onto a Russian oil drilling platform in the Bering Sea and they got arrested. People are still willing to obstruct and go to jail to try to preserve what they care most about in the environment. I don't hear anybody trying to protest and going to jail in favor of Nike sneakers or Vans or whatever, your, or Uggs or whatever you wear. But people go to jail for their whale. So that still touches us in our hearts. That's still the basis of some of the environmental movement. Eco-terrorism, this is a famous, famous group, uh, Dave Foreman and the Earth First Movement. They went to this dam and they painted a crack just to show that whatever we humans build is in danger of someday crumbling and there were people downstream that would suffer. So just to be aware of the effects of what you do. 
So this kind of eco-terrorism movement, harkening back to the saboteurs when they threw their shoes into the machinery back in industrial England in the 17th century. Well, today there's a bunch of environmental issues. Quick, read all of these and pick one. I, I can't even read them here, but you know, there's everything from you know genetically modified foods to global. If global warming scares you, do you know what global dimming is? Because of all the particulates we're putting into the earth, 15% less sunlight is reaching the earth than 50 years ago. This was validated in Australia with one method, in Germany with a second method, and in uh, Israel with a third method that have been tracking the amount of sunlight hitting the earth for, for, for decades. Uh, and it was discovered as a consequence of 911. A researcher out in Chicago noticed that, and that's O'Hare Airport's one of the busiest in the world, after 9-1-1, they shut down all airplanes for like three or four days. And he noticed the sky got blue. If I look at the sky, even on a sunny day here, it's not as blue as I remember being a kid. It's just not as blue. It's kind of more hazy, all the time hazy. There's a whole movement just to fight contrails. Because what does that contrail do with the particulates from the airplane fuels that go into the atmosphere that are causing global dimming? If your plants are getting 15% less sunlight, what percentage does that reduce our food supply? And if you reduce it by 15% in a country like Bangladesh, what happens and what do those people then do? It's almost like the situation with the King of Spain. You know, your country's security, people are gonna revolt. You're going to have wars, one country invading another country over land use, water, food issues. Okay, because whatever we do in the environment can lead to or reduce stability in the ecosystem, and that has an impact back on the economic system, and that has an impact back on the political system, and on your everyday lives. Make an issue, any issue, because again, Everything is connected to anything else. So there's no real solution except to infuse environmental thinking into everything we do. Each of us in this room, infusing that into everything we do. Every choice you make, it's your individual choices. It's societal choices and it's corporate and governmental choices. The whole watchword today is not save ecology, save environment. It's really realizing deeply that we're so connected to the environment that if we lose the environment, we're killing ourselves. So it's about sustainability. And that involves a social aspect where some of us are gonna go out and protest. It involves it being equitable, fair trade coffee, choose it because then somebody in Guatemala doesn't have to go out and cut down a rainforest. They can have the rainforest and their shade-grown coffee. You can have your coffee and they can have the rainforest that supports their whole way of life, okay? So that's the equitable. And it's economy. It's industry and business making decisions that if the rest of the earth matters, then it's not just, just extracting profits. They call it the triple bottom line now in business. The triple bottom line is, you want a monetary payoff for your, uh, for your stockholders, but you want to be fair to your employees because they're the ones that are going to buy your products. And then you've got to be fair also, a little harder to do, but you've got to be fair to the things without a voice, like the dolphins and the whales. So that's the triple bottom line. Good businesses are starting to embrace it. Okay, so it's sustainability means balancing all these things in such a way that we can maintain our lifestyle and have the things we want, but not destroy the earth in the process. It's all about sustainability now. That's the new environmentalism today. Personal choices, this is my lawnmower. It works on a, uh, on a cord. I mowed my lawn Friday night and I took this picture. And uh, I use a few cents worth of electricity 
instead of a few dollars worth of gas. The pollution is contained at the power plant. Yeah, it's a hassle dragging that cord around. Why I make that choice? And this is what I put on my lawn this spring, this fertilizer here. It's corn gluten meal. It's a waste product from corn when they extract the oil. But it's a great uh, weed killer. It prevents weed seeds from germinating and it breaks down to form a natural fertilizer. Yeah, it's more expensive than some of the other chemically based products, but you know what? You use it for three or four years, you don't need the other chemical products because this builds up in the lawn and keeps all the weeds from even ever sprouting. So you don't have to go out and spread massive amounts to kill them. Then here, this is my personal life. You know, this is my Prius. Uh, sorry about the... Uh, uh, the tagline up there, this I put up as a joke on my Facebook page. Yeah, no, if everyone drives a Prius, it's not going to totally solve global warming. This is just a joke. Okay, but do choose your next car as if the survival of the human race depends on it. Because guess what? It does. <clears throat> so do the math. This is supposed to be a STEM lecture, right? I have to throw some math in for Dr. Colpus. Annual vehicle miles driven in the U.S. Three, this is just the US, never mind the rest of the world. Three trillion. And a Prius gets on average, according to the <coughs> US Transportation Administration, 46 miles per gallon. Might I do a lot of city driving, I get about 38. On a highway, I'll get 52, 54. But average for all Priuses, uh, 46 miles to the gallon. You can check that on fuelly.com. Okay, so. If we drove 3 trillion miles, we'd use up 65 million gallons of gas. I had a Ford Explorer, so I used that as a model. I had a working Ford Explorer and not a status utility vehicle, because I had the wood chips in the back to prove it, that it was a working vehicle. And some people need them for work, but most people just drive them for status. If a Ford Explorer at 17 miles per gallon drove that same 3 trillion miles, it used 176 million gallons of gas. Do the math! What's the difference? It's huge. It's triple. Well, double. It's double. How many pounds of pollutants does that equal? I had trouble taking this picture because I couldn't find a regular incandescent light bulb in my house to take this picture. I had to go and borrow one. Okay? But uh, on my house, I should exchange exclusively over to LED lights. If we could do math on that and how many billions of uh, kilowatt hours would be saved if everybody just did that. Uh, here's an interesting project, uh, AirPi, a little Pi, Raspberry Pi computer, 30 bucks or whatever. Why did some monitoring equipment? You can do these kinds of projects. This was somebody's you know, science fair senior thesis project. Society has choices, the University of Chernobyl. Would you rather have this or a solar farm? Would you rather have Fukushima or wave turbines? Would you rather have fracking with all these fracking wells to inject steam and chemicals into the water, I mean into the earth, which might get into the water? Or whoops, oh, much best. Or would you rather have, you know, a wind farm? Here's your typical household energy use. You personally can reduce that because it's linked to that global temperature rise. When I was a kid, we had one TV, one telephone, one radio. That was it in the house. How many screens in your house right now? TV in every room, laptop, desktop, Wi-Fi connectors and all that. Okay. You can choose to have a car that emits or you can buy an electronic vehicle, Chevy Volt, something like that. Because the alternative is we lose our polar ice caps, which then allow more methane into the air, and then it has a, uh, a, a negative feedback cycle and we end up with a lot more global warming. You can have deforestation or you can have planting efforts. You can have trash, you can take the time to recycle. Lots of personal efforts. Farmers have to choose between allowing this runoff or planting riparian buffers. 
I surveyed a lot of these in my watershed work. You can plant the bioswale if you own. Someday you own a shopping plaza. You can choose a bioswale or you can choose a lot of runoff. We can choose the genetically modified foods versus the organic. I don't know about the safety of the genetically modified foods. I know the organics are safe. We can have that mercury poisoning or we can use rechargeable batteries to throw away a lot less mercury. Okay? So, whatever you do in our corporate investment, in your career choices, I have a friend who flies for, uh, for a service where they monitor rainforest. If you become a pilot, become a, uh, a, a, you know, fly over the rainforest. If you become a statistician, work on tracking wildlife. If you become an engineer, instead of working for Monsanto, design the next fuel pump. It all goes back to you and your choices. It's all about sustainability today. Thank you very much. I, I'll be around. If you don't have class, you can certainly ask any questions.